I'm very happy to be here in Estonia. This country means a lot to us Danes. Um, and I will start by a little exercise before I start my boring uh, um, lecture here. Uh, and the exercise is going back 800 years to your ancestors 800 years ago. They had independence, well, kind of, some of it, and, uh, and good, uh, good fortresses within Tallinn. And sitting tight there and trying to control their independence. Uh, but uh, can you can you um, can you send that inside your head? You're sitting there, independent for Estonia. This is nice. We're having this area for ourselves. But uh, a boat comes in, <laughs> bearing the Danish king Valdemar II, and he says something about Christianity. But what he really says is something about trade and trade uh, routes through Estonia. And uh, you are very safe within your castle. Um, and you can perhaps shout insulting things at King Valtimar uh, because you are very safe in here. And he says, well, okay, I will not stand this. I will attack you. And he tries to attack your fortress. And it's a very strong fortress. And you're very good soldiers. Um, so he is losing. But what happens? What happens? The sky opens. And down flies the Danish flag. And boosted by morale. He wins the fights and bully you into, uh, into uh, being uh, oppressed again. So this, these are the nice memories of Denmark for Estonia. I'm very sorry about the oppression, but we are, we are happy about the flag. Um, I was very inspired this, uh, um, by, by the uh, earlier um, uh, participants here, and I think Mayu, are you still here? Mayu from the museum? Okay. Yeah, I'm here. You're here? Thank, thank you, and all of you here. Um, I have to apologize to you because um, I brought my school, which are 14 to 70 years old, uh, to England, to London, uh, and uh, we visited the National um, uh, Museum, the uh, uh, National Gallery. Uh, but actually, it wasn't students visiting. It was uh, groups, small groups of uh, time um, agents that were smuggled into modern-day London uh, to solve a puzzle where the uh, professor, the evil professor Moriarty, you know him from Sherlock Holmes. Yes, he is very evil. He is very, very evil. And he, he had. Um, we had battled, the, the time agents had battled him before um, concerning some time travel, but now he had been even more evil. He could now uh, make pictures alive with some kind of gadget he had invented. Um, so the time agents must, had to go into the National Gallery to find out what was happening and uh, decode what was uh, happening in the, uh, in the area. They had special goggles that could make them see what Professor Moriarty was doing. So they were guided around at the museum, finding the pictures that was brought alive. And you can imagine that a picture of a Venetian merchant from 1400, they would be very puzzled just walking around in a museum or nymphs uh, dancing around on a forest, suddenly was in mid-London. So these agents had the, the task to talk these people back into their painting and find out what was wrong and what was happening and what, why Professor Moriarty was there. So they were guided from area to area in this uh, museum and the guards were, were having, uh, um, they, they were a bit uh, mysterious about this because they had students very engaged in something. They were not used to that. I think it must be the most boring job at all in, in the world, sitting in the National Gallery looking at people looking at paintings. So, so they were just, they were, uh, they, they, they thought this was strange, um, but we kept it, of course, time agents are very good at this. They kept it, of course, so nobody noticed. Okay, this was an anecdote from how we work at Busterskov, but I will tell another story, um, and I hope the, uh, I hope you can follow me on these. Um, and uh, it is about a girl we had at school. She was uh, not very happy with school. Um, they come to us with eight years of traditional school, and then they have one or two years uh, with us, and then they have exams. She was not very happy being at school. She was not very good at it. Her grades were awful. Um, 
I don't, don't know your rating system, but she has E's and F's, which are just below anything. Um, and she was dyslexic, and she was on top of that also an uh, autistic girl. So she, she didn't uh, expect much of school, uh, and nobody else expected much of school. She was at the uh, exams for history, and her subject was the Roman Senate. And she was asked, and the teacher was a bit anxious about this exam, because this could go very wrong. Uh, asked, how does the Senate work? And she, she uh, rose to her feet, and she explained in detail how the Roman Senate worked. She could explain everything about the voting, and who was in, in which position, and how you can propose things at the Senate, uh, and uh, who you elect and what their names was, uh, the, the, um, the function was. And uh, she was given uh, a B, which is the next best uh, grade, um, and uh, after that her teacher asked her, how, how did you do that? Why did you, how, how did you know all this? And she answered, I was there. And she was, she was there. <laughs> Because we had been there, we had travelled to ancient Rome. Um, in between um, the theory and the, the, the writing, I have some anecdotes, just pictures, so you can just absorb them, and perhaps I will divert into talking about them. But this is a, a park in East Berlin in the 1980s, as you can surely see. Um, from um, from a week where they went from the 50s to the hunk of the 90s in one week. Very funny, actually. What we can do and you can do in school is that we can create narratives in the classroom that touches on all subjects in school, the curriculum, and all subjects, subjects of life. This is possible, and I will try to tell you how we do it, and I hope you can do it too. We will have a workshop tomorrow where we'll try it. Um, this is not me, this is uh, Bobby Fischer playing his duel against Boris Spassky in 1972, and of course you can hear in the background all the protesters against the Cold War that was there. This was a game about the Cold War. Um, Boris Spassky lived at the hotel, I was uh, situated in, in Tallinn. I was very impressed. And here are some students from Vistoskov, very normal students, as you can see. Um, it's a boarding school. This is very common in Denmark to send your uh, young persons, 14, 15 years old, to one or two years at a boarding school like this. Uh, we have over 200 in Denmark. Um, so it's a culture dating back to uh, the, 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 an idea of enlightenment uh, that was progressed in the 1800s, that you should go away, you should be with other people and try to be enlightened and uh, be together and uh, live away from home and, and practice to be away from home. Um, and, um, but we are the only school that teaches this way. Uh, the others teach it in more traditional ways, but it's still boarding schools, a lot of boarding schools in Denmark. Um, the uh, students, we have a, around 90 students, they are the age group of 14 to 17, so this is a very different age group from the one we just heard about. Um, we uh, have some special needs students, uh, as I told you about before, but it is uh, normal exams for uh, all students and most of them go to uh, high school, continues to high school. Um, they, they play games in their spare time, role-playing games and food games and uh, uh, tabletop games. Um, discuss manga and um, cosplay and they're very into the, and they read fantasy literature and science fiction. Um, surprise, more boys than girls. We can discuss that later. We still have over 20 girls out of the population of 90. We are impressed by that. You, you might not be, but we are impressed by that. Uh, and the, uh, the staff, 10 teachers, uh, making these uh, um, 
that makes these learning games and they work five at a time, five in each team. One week teaching, one week preparing and then changing with the other team. Um, this is difficult to organize in a traditional school, but it is possible in this sporting school because they also have other duties than teaching. So they have teaching that will be around this one concentrated week and then nothing for the other week. And so, of course also some, some uh, staff to give them food and prepare the house for them. Clean. They clean themselves, but they have help. Um, Japan, 14 something. So this is, this is the formula. We give the student empowered roles. Two words there, empowered and roles, I'll get back to that. In interesting settings, something that might interest them, a setting um, like the setting I presented to you, you are under siege by the Danish king. That might be an interesting setting to children in Estonia. I hope you win the war in that setting then. Um, and with motivating narratives, something happening that is interesting. Uh, story, the old storyline um, way was not necessarily so new things happening. They, uh, in, in this you had to present something that happens during the game. Either you compete, oh, I'll get back to that. This is not a drama school. It is often uh, thought of as a drama school, but it isn't. It is not performing other people's plays, uh, probably dead people's plays. No, it is interacting with other people. It is being a participant and not uh, a spectator. Very important point, also an ethical point. Um, and that was the preparation way. Um, oh, yeah. Now I'll come to an example. Um, one of the learning games that we have here. And uh, of course, car flag should be destroyed. And Hannibal and his elephants. Mm -hmm. The power of Rome, a one week um, learning game where the students have the roles of important Roman families. And uh, it is in the time just before the empress stepped in, which means the power is divided, still divided. Uh, and uh, they have goals, and it is to help the empire survive because Hannibal is of course attacking, so they must keep together to have the empire keep keep together. But they also have to further their own interests as a family: more power, more wealth, more colonies, more diplomatic missions, perhaps more legions, so they can go out, win a war, and throw the dice and go back and be an emperor, which Julius Caesar did. So it is actually a game of either surviving or being the new Julius Caesar, or being the new Julius Caesar for a very short time before your death <laughs> by stabbing. Um, so um, the organization would be eight people in the family, and they would all be um, active in ancient Rome. They would go to meetings, senate meetings, or soft Senate meetings or work groups that will present new architecture to Rome and so on. Um, and let's see, um, let's see. Ah, this was one that came back with a lot of legions and say, now I decide. You can tell that he, perhaps you say this is about winning, no it is, well, well he won because he was the emperor, but um, he was killed the next day, so I don't know if he won anything. So it is just playing, even losing is playing uh, to win. Even, even having, if you are in a, in a game where you are trying to achieve a goal and you don't, it's still an experience that you can learn from and think is very, very good. He was very excited that he was killed. He was like, that was a good story. So, so he was happy about the storytelling. Okay, subjects, because curriculum is uh, in every school's system, you have to have curriculum uh, presented. And this is the curriculum, some of the curriculum that was presented during this game. Um, it's a lot to, uh, to go through, but this is an example, a long list of things that happens in different subjects. Let's pick 
pick one out uh, in math, the architects would like to have these noble families help them work the uh, the angle of the aqueducts coming into Rome because they are they have a water supply problem, so they have to work with angles and build uh, and and build in uh, in cardboard uh, a, a aqueduct and they have to draw how it is done. Um, in uh, social science, you could do a lot of discussing how empires work. You know, empires you are just left just to one side of a large empire. So being close to an empire is very, a very interesting discussion uh, in school. Um, the Vesuvius is exploding. Very good material on that. It's just, just beside Rome, so it's very interesting to see what happens to Rome when a, a, a volcano explodes. Um, one of my favorites is that the slave traders only speak the third language. So, if you want good slaves, then you have to speak the language. You can practice all the words, and then you can go in and buy your slaves and see how good they are. Um, and uh, gladiator fighting for the for some of the boys that wants that, and a lot of a lot of different uh, subjects that could put in that uh, gives curri curriculum that is interesting for uh, for the teacher, and it is also relevant for the student. It's put into this because it's relevant and interesting. Okay. Ah, hmm. Now we some. Now we are out of space. Yes. Okay. We had to isolate these crews. They they were infected. Too bad. Hmm. Okay. So this is the structure of how we do these learning games. We have a pretend universe. Um, it's some kind of setting. We can choose from. History, which is obvious, um, but we can also choose from this society. You can choose a government or a, um, a newspaper, uh, something that is inside society. Or we can go out into literature and choose a literary uh, universe. And that could be movies or um, genres that we know, um, spaghetti westerns or Romance is also a genre that is in, within literature. It doesn't have to be a book that gives this Harry Potter. It would be a good literature background and universe. Then we have to empower the student roles in this universe. We have to give them roles that actually does something in that universe, which has um, uh, an imp uh, impact um, on, the, uh, on this universe, that can decide things that will happen <coughs> in the universe, in this pretend universe. Oh, and then uh, um, we have the narrative structures is how do we get the game going? How do we get this universe and these roles to interact with each other? And there are different ways to, depending on which kind you choose, which kind of game you, you want to play with the, with the students. It could be that something happens, Hannibal invades or stops a dropping. Um, or you can introduce some kind of friendly competition between groups. Um, you can send them out all as gentlemen competing to be, and gentlewoman, to compete to get around the, the, uh, the globe in uh, fewer days than the other groups. So uh, then you can irritate them and be better at uh, solving problems and speaking your way through borders and uh, finding out why, where the uh, wind is blowing, geograph geographic uh, knowledge, so your air balloon can go further than the other groups. Or you can um, have an engine uh, where you uh, build, build up something, which is a very popular thing amongst young people, building, building up things. Uh, be building up a, a family tree, a colony, uh, some armies, a political system, a new political system, independent. Or you can try to introduce shared feelings where you make, uh, where, where the point is that you together try to simulate something that gives you a, a very profound feeling of something. Uh, and and the, it, it's exam being behind the iron curtain, you know that. The student don't know that. So we, we, we have to give them a feeling in how it is to be behind the iron curtain. We have to uh, make a game where they really feel being behind the iron curtain. 
um, Flower Power Funk, uh, the Salam Witch Trials. You can build up a, a situation with uh, uh, pilgrims where they try to mist where they start mistrusting each other, and uh, they have to have scapegoats and uh, and society. Their local society and religion breaks down, and they they have to do new new decisions: do we burn witches or do we not? Ah, oh, okay. Hans Christian Andersen just wrote a fairy tale, so of course we can reenact a fairy tale also and have them interact in that fairy. They're actually very nice, even though they play cold-hearted. Okay, motivation is the key word uh, for this. Um, how do we motivate students in the classroom? We have all the normal tools, all the teacher's tools, you know, and then some, because when we play these learning games, we also have uh, subjects that are presented relevant to the roles they're playing. It is relevant for them to pick up the, the, uh, the test or the uh, exam or the, the problem solving. Um, and uh, you can also put in some bonuses. Um, who mentioned, oh, Paul, you mentioned about um, that if you, if you do your home or all your schoolwork, then you will have two hours Friday afternoon. So kind of a bonus. But you can introduce that directly into the, uh, the teaching by having bonuses for doing things, being active, uh, making your essays, uh, writing your things, being active in the game. Then you can have bonuses for your role. It will evolve and, and be better or more influential or have more money. Another example, taken from literature, Harry Potter. This is our dining room. It's not as uh, beautiful as in uh, Harry Potter, unfortunately. But if we get more funding, we will go for it. And move to Scotland. Mm. Harry Potter. The students are students at Hogwarts, and they are members of one of the houses. I guess you know Harry Potter, right? No. Mm. Okay. Um, they have motiv their motive. They have strive to be good magicians, which is on an individual level. They have to be better than the others, so there's a friendly competition to be like the, the girl with, mm, I know all the answers. Um, and uh, this is an individual motive in the game, and then they also have a collective motive with their house, trying to win competitions. Again, a list of different subjects that can be introduced in the Harry Potter world. You can do, um, you can write diaries from their school. Uh, in, we have English as a second language. Very important to know about the English system. Harry Potter introduces the English uh, school system and it's possible to read texts that are directly relevant to what they are doing in English. Directly relevant, very good word. Um, and math and third language and um, you can, in social sciences, discuss the, this, the debate they have about mud blood and half blood. Um, yeah, and I think it is possible to play Quidditch in a swimming pool. I haven't tried it because they did it some other way, but it could be interesting. Okay, another example. So here is Moriarty and his time machine, and um, Galilei, which is at the back. Here he had that problem, he had invented the telescope. But uh, his neighbor was a very beautiful uh, lady, uh, placed by Professor Moriarty. So instead of looking at the stars, he looked at this beautiful lady at the next door. And the time agents had to convince him that it was interesting to look at the stars. So they were actually students telling the teacher why the subject was interesting. Oh, yes, and uh, that's Hans Christian Andersen. He was trying to, to um, he was being manipulated into writing journalist stories instead of fairy tales. So the students had to convince him that fairy tales were very important to write. Um, new tools, teachers' new tools. We have all the tools we know as a teacher, but we also have the tools that are in the game. We can appeal to them in the game to play the game. Because playing and playing in a game uh, has some other social rules. 
some other social structures that keep this together and you can refer to them. That gives an, another very important tool. Ethics. I would like to, um, to talk about ethics. Three, three things. Empowering the students uh, is, a, is a very important point. If we, don't, if we don't practice students being empowered, having power, being influential of the world, what kind of people are we putting into the world? So we have to give them empowerment. We have to give them influence of what they're doing. It's very difficult in the normal classroom you can uh, take some pencils, or you can be the one taking the, the board, uh, wiping the board, or something. You can, but but if you don't make pretend worlds, they will have influence on the pretend worlds, and they will practice having influence on their uh, surroundings um, and being influential people. And we have to educate our, our students to be influential in society because we want them to be influential in society. And uh, I, about identity. Uh, at young teenagers, uh, life is very frail. You can be um, you can be uh, bullied, and you can have problems with your identity, uh, not daring trying your identity out. But this is possible within the game because you are using a mask, and behind that mask you can try out things. And if it doesn't work, then your identity isn't crushed, but the mask is crushed, and you can learn from it behind the mask. And that is very important to have that possibility to try out things behind the mask and not get hurt. And the third thing, I have mentioned it, but it is a very important point. It is very important to be a participant rather than a spectator, which means we have to get them out of the auditorium and get them being a participant in our education, being someone that does something. Another example, we'll just drop that. It's uh, playing Africa. A bit complicated though, where we move in different places. I think I've used my time right. About okay. Um, this is uh, structured so we start out as apes and go out to colonies, colonize Africa, and then decolonize Africa, and then help Africa. It's uh, it is it looks complicated, but it's one of the best uh, we ever done because it gives us the view on how um, we have acted in history. But I'm, I'm running out of time. Oh, yeah, independence. These uh, students actually, on their own, uh, made a song, an independent song for US, which they sang very loudly. So the uh, English colonist uh, uh, ambassador, he was uh, just uh, he, he would he would like to speak to the subjects of the North American colonists, but they sang very loud. So he would he just went he he left and uh, and they had. Uh, independence and wrote their own uh, independence statement, letter of independence. Um, this is the last thing. Um, theory, if you want to have some theory on this, then um, simulator relevance is our own uh, um, term. We simulate relevance because it's in the pretend world. It doesn't really happen, but it, it's the same parts of the brain working on this. This they have measured on this if you uh, if you make a if you make a game or a pretend it is the same parts of the, the brain being active so you can just as well practice in a pretend world that is also because that's also why firemen do practices uh, so we do the same in our school and learning by doing practical scaffolding and learning ahead higher which are three of the uh, old school pedagogues Dewey, Piaget and Vygotsky and then this uh, Thomas here that calls for a new contract in the classroom, and this is a new contract in the classroom. Oh, Jack the Ripper, his last one. Um, actually, he has four personalities taking shift for one quarter of an hour, speaking for him. So when it's quarter uh, half past, then a new one has the hat and is now Jack the Ripper talking, or the suspect of Jack. We didn't know who exactly Jack the River was in this game. And questions and answers. <laughs> ah. I hope it didn't go too fast at the, at the end, but uh, fast paced perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat>
be the center. Ni, kysy mut siit. How many of your students go to drama school after to graduating to drama school? Drama school? Not many, no. They, they're not really drama students. They like to interact, but it's not a spectator sport. If you participate in a role play, then you're part of it, and it's actually very difficult to be a spectator of a role play because you have to be in it. Uh, and you don't see much if you're just where you are, you have to participate in it. But there are, of course, some of them interested in, in that, and some of the best dressed, well dressed students are interested in, in doing uh, drama. Yes. But it is an interaction form, it is a, a game, it's a play, it's playing, it's not performing. Playing, performing. Uh, spectator, uh, participant. Two different worlds. Uh, you said earlier that uh, we might be interested in the fact that there are more uh, boys in your uh, school than uh, than girls. Why? Um, there, there is a um, yes, we can. This is a very good discussion. There is something about girls and playing. There's something happening to girls that does uh, something to them that they stop playing. They, f they freeze in their playing life. And our mission is that we should have a playing life for all lives. Not playing as children. I don't play as children. I play as an adult. I play games that challenge me as an adult. So, but we are losing the girls uh, also in the cre uh, creative parts of the, of the school. We are losing the kids. At about seventh grade, every creative uh, subject stops in Danish schools and they concentrate on math and da, da, da. So this is, and this is poorly because if we want to be in, in, in uh, if we want to have innovation in our society, we have to use our imagination and creativity. So we have to keep that alive. So, so I will do everything I can to let children play into their grown-up lives and adapt the games and the playing they're doing to their adult lives and even more to get the girls being allowed doing that. And there's theories are that um, uh, they are more frozen in roles because of their interaction with girls. That's one theory. Another is that their body sooner than the boys says this is serious, you can be a mother, while the boys are just mm -hmm. So, so there are a lot of theories. You can also have a cultural theory where mothers are not as educated as fathers, so they hold on to their daughters to be more educated. Mm -hmm. Can you see the point in that? Yeah. Which is not very good because they grab them at yeah. traditional school. You have to sit tight and listen mm -hmm. because you, I want you to be more than me. Mm -hmm. But if they want, if the girls want to go into the innovation. Uh, jobs and they are very well paid, then they also have to learn to play into their adult lives. This is one of my ethics. Yes. Okay. Was that, did that answer some of it? Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult subject. Kysimus on selline, et võibolla ma ei saanud hästi aru sellest, et nädal aega oli enne rolli mängu ettevalmistus aeg, et kas õpetajad oma keskis valmistasid ette või nad valmistasid ette õpilasi selleks rollimänguks? A very good question. Um, it is the teachers. They prepare how to, put, how to make this game uh, flow from Monday morning until Friday. Uh, when I hear this question, uh, not this question, but when I hear a question like this, it is often understood that you prepare for the role playing games with the children, and then when you prepare for a lot of time, then you play. Uh, that is actually not a good way to do it, because the children are doing, they are not in the game. They're just preparing for it. They're just waiting to get started. So we started at, at that time, we started Monday morning, then you are in the game, but it will develop, and you will have more uh, knowledge. You will read more about the game. You, of course, uh, the Roman game. You you don't know much about Rome, but the first day you read about Rome, but you're in character, so you just make your character stronger in knowledge. So start the game at at eight o'clock instead of uh, using three days to make rubber swords or or sewing things. No reason to prepare with the with the students. Just 
put them into the game. But it is the, the teachers preparing how they should run the game and, and then switching with the other team. Okay. Did that answer? Okay. You can see. Hello. I'm, I'm Herdi from Iceland. And I'm not going to ask you and about anything because I understand you so well. I think we are related. <laughs> and what I have been doing uh, for since 74 with children from 7 to 9, it is almost the same. We have to meet. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was wonderful. <laughs> Ja nüüd on kaks viimast küsimust ka praegu kohjuks. Ega. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, who, ex, uh, who is it? Who, uh, um, how do you know where to start next game? Who is uh, who's going to tell if it's Rome or something else? Uh, that is prepared the, the year before the teachers have had a meeting where they say, well, we'll do this and this and this and I'll, I'll master this and I'll do this and I'll do this. And then the, the teacher said, okay, I have this array of uh, 35 uh, weekly games. I will put in my subjects like this and this and this and this. And so they will go prepared into the preparation room. Yeah, so, the, so the students, they don't come into the, you know, the, to excite, uh, to like take uh, decisions about what is... No. no, no, they take decisions in the games, but okay. it has been proven, not proven, it has shown to be not very, um, they're, they're not good enough for planning these games. Okay. But we hope they come back with a teacher's degree. Then the last person, do you have a website about all this? Yes, yes, we have our own website. Oh, I hadn't written it over there, but it's the uh, Osterskop. Okay, thank you. That's the, the server. And there is a presentation in English. I would like to ask about the preparation of teachers. What uh, subjects they have learned or how long it takes the preparation to be this kind of teacher? Um, if, if they have normal preparation time for a teacher in Denmark. Yeah, um, there is a, of course this looks like, well this would take time to make. But it take, takes time to make the first one. Then you can reuse it the year after and the year after. It's like when you're a new teacher and you make a new year in English studies. Then you lose a lot of time preparing that. But the next year, it's so, so it's the same with this. Was that what you asked? No, okay. I am Mura Roma Sõna, and the last question is to ask you to ask you to ask you to ask What would be your comment for today's auditorium of boys and girls? <laughs> That, um, <laughs> that was a very good question. Um, so it would be a, an appeal that, um, that you help your children being more playful and keep their playfulness. And I want to say one thing about uh, identity, which is not gender related, but um, which I, I failed to mention here. I'll get back to your question when my, uh, my mind has worked with it. Um, about frozen roles, when you see school children through, through school time, they go the wrong way about roles, they freeze within a role instead of broadening, which means that we actually do this with the children for their choices of life, instead of doing this, instead of broadening their choices of life, be, make them pretend to be an engineer in seventh grade, they might be an engineer. Instead of saying, okay, now you're not very good at math, so you will not become an engineer. No, you can, okay, you will sit in an office. So, so try to do this instead of this with your education. I know you do, but this is my appeal to, uh, to give them the broadest, the broadest uh, approach to society. But the gender issue. <laughs> um, it was also in the, um, uh, when, he, High school uh, manager was a ma was male and uh, yes um, and you you have smaller children female this is I don't know what uh, what happens um, here but uh, you you might help me and I see there are some points on the uh, agenda 
discussing gender. Agenda, discussing gender. Uh, so I don't know how exactly to uh, to answer you, but I'm looking forward to the workshop tomorrow mm -hmm. to see a lot of uh, mm -hmm. female teachers walking straight into this and fighting a fight for playing in, cl in classrooms. Mm -hmm. But I see you point. Okay, me. Nee. We have to let you off the hook. <laughs> but uh, firstly, I wanted to thank you. We have something for you. And a big applause. Thank you very much.